Black News Podcast. My name is Doris Davenport, and I'm a correspondent for Black News. We want to thank the Chicago West Community Music Center for being the producers of this wonderful podcast. We've entertained some wonderful folk. You know, we started with Dion Warwick, and we're going right on down the line. Well, we've got somebody equally important, and somebody I am just so excited to bring to you today. It is none other than a woman whom you all remember as Miss America, Vanessa Williams. Vanessa Williams is the producer of A Wonderful World. It's a new musical. It tells the life story of Louis Armstrong, and we're going to be talking about this musical today. Welcome to Black Muse Podcast, Vanessa. Thank you very much, Doris. It's so good to have you today. You know, I am just so curious about so many things. Your career is stellar. You've done so many wonderful things. And now you've added producer to your array of accomplishments. What is it like to be a producer? Well, you've mentioned wonderful a few times, and that's exactly <laughs> why I'm here, uh, producing A Wonderful World. Um, a producer hat is pretty extensive. It's not only getting a production up and running, it's dealing with advertising and marketing, raising funds, finding theater space, uh, getting rights for music. This particular uh, show, it's all about Louis Armstrong and his life, uh, and he had a long, extraordinary life. In our show, we break down his life into four parts. We have the beginning, which is in New Orleans, and we start with his first wife, Daisy, who was a lady of the evening and start uh, in his life there where he became um, spectacular uh, with his trumpet playing and really stood out. From there we go on to Chicago where he meets his second wife, Lil Hardin. And uh, yes, and she teaches him how to read music, but also teaches him the the uh, the jazz scene uh, in in Chicago, and is a dynamic duo with him, uh, playing with him because she was an extraordinary music musician herself. Then, after his success in Chicago, he goes out to Hollywood to claim his movie uh, success, and uh, that's when he runs into and marries his third wife, Alpha. And uh, from the success in, Bra in Hollywood, he comes to Queens, New York, and uh, finishes out the rest of his life with his wife Lucille. So um, it's been wives. four wives. Yeah. So it's been a great. He was busy, and it was a, a great opportunity to structure the show with the cities and his time frames that he was married to his, life, his wives. Uh, that was my first initial attraction. Um, hearing that it, it involved his wives and their personalities and what they brought to his life, um, but also it was an opportunity to uh, exalt uh, a, a global genius who was like none other. Uh, Wynton Marsalis tells this great story in, in one of the documentaries about him. He was at Juilliard. Uh, he, I think he got to Juilliard when he was 16 or 17, and he was kind of scoffing at, you know, Louis Armstrong's legacy, and his father said, learn how to play this. Mm. And he's like, oh yeah, and he worked on it all night and could barely get through it. He mastered it, but it was one of those um, solos that was extraordinary. And he said, oh, I, I get it. I understand why Pops mm. was the best in his time. So uh, it, it's being able to show a little bit of his genius, show the struggles that he had to deal with in his career, um, giving joy to the world, but also, you know, in the 60s during the, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, he had a lot of pushback because people thought he was a sellout because of who he was, what his personality was, and what he had to go through in his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you saw the pain of him uh, having people turn their backs on him. Uh, you see him uh, get a chance for another opportunity when he gets the success of Hello, Dolly. Um, when he's like, what's going on and why am I being recognized now? And you realize it's a global sensation. We talk about him being an ambassador, which again, he's like little old me, and he ends up uh, getting a chance to bring his music to the world. And you, and you show um, the, the, the real partnership, particularly at the end, with his wife Lucille, who basically 
uh, allowed him to have the home that he always wanted, being on the road, growing up extremely poor, and yeah. finally being able to have his home, which is now a museum. So you can go visit the museum in Queens. That's right, in Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What, you know, you talked about some of the pressures and challenges that he had as a black man. And I know the show touches on but maybe does more than just touch on the whole issue of race. <laughs> How important do you think that is today? And maybe share a little bit about some of the characters like Lincoln Perry in mm -hmm. the show and um, just what role they play. What are they highlighting? What message are they telling us about race? Uh, interesting you, you mentioned Lincoln Perry because that was a choice that we, me as a black producer and the only black producer in the room mm -hmm. and other creators, um, that was one choice that we wrestled with. Uh, Lincoln Perry and Stephen Fetcher bring an instant triggering to many of us. Yeah, I remember the 50s. Uh, yes, and, uh, and uh, Lewis is also very close to Bojangles, which again, uh, consummate performers and um, sometimes a trigger for uh, uh, quote, unquote, un, quote unquote Uncle Tomming mm -hmm. uh, and um, playing into a system. And, and just because we know this show is all about educating people yes. too. Um, yes. Stephen Fetchett was known as the laziest man on earth, uh, which is why people have that triggering right. probably, right? And the reason why it works effectively in this is that we show that uh, Lincoln Perry, who played Stephen Fetchett, it was his idea to come up with the character. Mm -hmm. And he is the one that has four Cadillacs and a whole wealth of, of, of objects and, and plentitude because of what he did. So what we try to highlight is that this was what he used to have agency and get over, but also create his wealth. So when Lewis is, uh, uh, reduced to, oh, that smile is fake, Lewis says, this is my smile uh -huh. that I own. Mm -hmm. And besides owning it, this is what has brought joy to people, and I'm not going to back down from what has brought my agency and my wealth mm -hmm. from what I do and, and what is really me. So that is definitely mm -hmm. um, uh, something that is brought up in, in Act Two. Uh, so yes, it, it is a, a history lesson. Uh, there is one, um, in, in Act One, there is one riverboat uh, scene where once he began to get really famous or, or uh, you know, noticed for his talent, he was part of a band, King Joe's band, and they played on the riverboats, mm -hmm. and that's how he made money. And in one particular situation that we have in the show, um, there's a banjo player that uh, is wrongly accused of something and he disappears. Uh -oh. So we talk about the lynching and what has happened uh, year after year mm -hmm. and what they as black men had to navigate from going from New Orleans to yes. Chicago to run away from the systematic lynching that they saw over and over again. So yes, it is a, it is a history lesson. Uh, there's so much that we tried to pack. It's a little too long. Once we get to Broadway, we're going to do some <laughs> editing because it's you know it's nearly three hours. Which, as an audience member, you you, you certainly want to celebrate everything. But yeah. uh, as a as a business person, we need to <laughs> keep in mind that we want the audience to stay engaged. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and you know, when I think about a wonderful world, and I look at the cast, it is becoming a bit more commonplace in the last couple of years to see people who look like you and I on the stage. You and a few of your A-list celebrity friends have taken a leadership role when it comes to equity and diversity on Broadway. Tell us what it is that you guys are doing. Well, I think you're referring to Black Theatre United, which we started uh, in, in uh, right after the, the murder of George Floyd. So we're basically uh, three years old. And um, it was kind of a call to arms. Uh, we were all home stuck watching this horrible murder, you know, on our phones, not believing that it could happen. And um, I got a, a call from Audrey McDonald, who was discussing what had happened with LaShawn's, and we all called friends. I called Wendell Pierce, and we're like, what can we do? 
Um, so it was a variety of approaches, like what do we do and what, how can we make a difference? And we did a series of town halls. Sherilyn Eiffel was one of our first guests, and Stacey Abrams was talking about uh, the census. Sherilyn was talking about um, uh, loss and showing up to make sure that you are represented when these laws are up for votes. Um, and after that, we really dug into our industry on Broadway and wanted to make sure that there was diversity, that it wasn't just the door was going to be open and closed and nothing was going to happen. And I think our biggest accomplishment was the New Deal for Broadway, which was a series of conferences that we had with every aspect of the theater industry, theater owners, producers, creatives, industry, um, um, uh, IATSE, um, which is the, the union members, um, and, uh, and talked about how there needed to be change and inclusion in each level, uh, not only within the, the, the makeup of what each level does, but also sensitivity training which we made sure that everybody agreed that there was going to be sensitivity training regardless. Whether you are in the union, when, when you show up to work as an usher, you're going to get training. Whether you are a producer, make sure that you provide it for your cast before you start anything. So those are, um, I would say, that was our kind of our hallmark, our, our, our real claim to fame. And we continue to do the work with the mentorship uh, programs. Uh, we have uh, many committees that we are actively involved and I think uh, being in the producer role allows me to continue the work so you have a diverse producing uh, team uh, hopefully on every uh, musical and play and production that is coming to Broadway and also on Broadway. Is this your first um, producing role or it is? It's my first producing role in theater. I've produced um, uh, you know, a tel television movie I did years ago, actually, which I loved. It was it was about the the first Black Order of Nuns in New Orleans, go heading back to New Orleans, uh, called The Courage to Love, and I played uh, Sister Henriette Delisle, who's still uh, she's venerated, and we're waiting for her to to become a, a saint. But she's in the lineup. But uh, so that was my first production producer role um, in general. But this is my first time for theater. Beautiful, and you know, I always have loved your voice, and you have so many talents, though. When I think about music, what, what do you feel about music as a device for storytelling? I mean, a lot of people, you know, used to go into the theater mm -hmm. and they hear the narrative word, mm -hmm. but talk to us a little bit about how music fits into storytelling. Well, I think it, it's an advantage for me to be a musician and also a producer because I can sit and listen to and watch a show and say there's too much underscoring why is there so much what we need to we're, we're missing out on the action we're missing out on the emotion of what is being said in the words so i i i think that's also part of my skill set i'm not just how do we make money and how do we get yeah. people in the seats and how can we advertise it's okay what are we saying what are the moments that are, are, are really captivating the audience and how can we make it better? So I think that's kind of uh, my, my gift and, and really uh, my, my power in this particular thing. Not only do I know as an actor what goes into making this incredible show entertaining, but also how can we make it better? Yeah, because I always wonder, you know, how do you measure the success of a show? Is it just about ticket sales? What, what are some of the other... Um, well, ticket sales for sure <laughs> help to measure shows. Uh, uh, <laughs> exactly, um, and 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 feeling. Um, you know, I remember I went to a show called Once Three Times, and it was a very uh, uh, simply produced show. It was in a pub. Um, it was all live music, so every person who was an actor also played. And it was simple and beautiful, and you listen to the story, and you're captivated by the music. And uh, it's those kind of soul links that want you to see it again and again. Of course, I mean, right now, Hamilton is still the hottest ticket on Broadway because of not only the uh, uh, amazing um, production that you see on stage, but the score. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I talk about my, my daughter who was in high school at the time and when Hamilton came out and she played the soundtrack over and over. She hadn't even seen the show yet, but she 
played the soundtrack over and over. All her friends listened to the soundtrack, and the soundtrack was a hit. So then getting tickets was like, can I please get tickets to see what I already know all of Eliza's words? And then they actually get a chance to see Eliza, and they want to go over it again and again. So what we hope with Wonderful World and also another issue with producing is getting rights to music yeah. that is already established. No, uh, exactly, because we've got a legacy of Louis Armstrong singing Hello Dolly, singing all these amazing duets with Ella Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. All of those are written by other people and owned by other people. Yeah. So as a producer, you have to try to cut a deal mm -hmm. and see whether you can have them in the show. So uh, it ain't as easy as doing <laughs> original music. So uh, that's another hurdle that we've we're constantly trying to work with. What is the main message that uh, you want to get across to the audience with The Wonderful World? I think the main message uh, is to have the audience see what an amazing legacy, even though he was a flawed man like all of us are, mm -hmm. the amazing legacy and virtuosity that he had as a trumpet player, a musician, a, a human being, a humanitarian, uh, and the end of the story, he is teaching kids on the block how to play. Mm -hmm. And it's all about connecting with community. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reason why when you go to the U.S. Open, you see Louis Armstrong Stadium right that's next right, to you. Right. Or when you fly yeah, into New Orleans, the there's a, it's the Louis Armstrong yeah. Airport. Mm -hmm. um, he reached global um, prominence because of his joy, his spirit, and his musicality. Now, what does it mean to you to be in Chicago um, opening this show? I know you just had a wonderful opening in New Orleans last week. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you, for you to be in Chicago? Because this is not your first time here. You've done a several projects here at Chicago. I've done a lot of films. One of my uh, favorites, yeah. Soul Food. Soul Food oh my was God. shot here, yes. Hoodlum was shot with mm -hmm. Lawrence Fishburne mm -hmm. and, and Miss Cicely Tyson. Um, I did Kid Who Loved Christmas here years ago. Uh, but since we're following Lewis's life, this is stop number two. This is when he really, really got famous. And this is when, you know, the jazz era for him really popped off. So it's wonderful to be able to ha bring Wonderful World and have the Chicago audience see their, their city reflected. Yeah. Uh, not only in the music and the vibe, but also the joy and also Lil Harden, who plays his wife, who's an extraordinary, all the women, <laughs> all the talent is amazing. So I hope that our Chicago oh, audience uh, really can connect to our, our moment in Chicago in the show. I can't wait. I am so excited. And we know that it's playing at the Cadillac Palace Theater. Yes. It opens October 12th yes. through the 29th. Exactly. Um, everybody can go to www.broadwayinchicago.com mm -hmm. for tickets. Mm -hmm. And I think lastly, what I want to uh, touch on is what's next with you? We want to see you back on stage. And, in films, what are you working on? What's coming up? Uh, well, I'm working on new music, so I'll have a new album out next uh, next year, yes, which is fantastic. Yes, and yes, uh, yes. and in terms of um, you know, luckily since the strike does not uh, it has nothing to do with theater, I, I've done a couple of uh, uh, workshops that will happen in probably 2020. Five, mm -hmm. but uh, for film, film and television, um, we're still on strike, and oh. we're far from um, having uh, our negotiations, um, you know, finalized. So um, I have no idea when we'll all go back to work uh, as a, a film and uh, film and, and television mm -hmm. actor. Well, you are such a fantastic ambassador for this show. Thank you. I have listened to your interviews, <laughs> um, listened to you talk about it, and nobody tells this story better. Oh, good. I thank you so much for being on Black News Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. This is Vanessa Williams, everybody. Miss America. <laughs> 40 years <laughs> Always later. Always will be our Miss America. <laughs> Always. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.